Welcome and thank you for our 3G panel today. My name is Beth Keen and I'm the CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. I'm thrilled to be here today with my fellow 3Gs and um, we wanted to say a special thank you to Jonathan Ornstein and Michael Berenbaum for coming up with the idea for Holocaust Survivor Day and for inviting us to do this panel. Um, before we dive into our conversation today, I just wanted to do some quick introductions of our panelists. Um, we have Anat Barber. Um, she's the Assistant Director of Capital Gifts and Special Initiatives at UJA Federation of New York, and she spearheads their community initiative for Holocaust survivors. Um, all four of her grandparents were Holocaust survivors. We have Stacy Science, who serves as a trustee for the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, and she's a board member of the Auschwitz Jewish Center Foundation a member of the Next Generation Council for the USC Shoah Foundation and co-chair of the Town of Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. Her children were featured in the HBO documentary, The Number on Great Grandpa's Arm. And Hen Yurista is the Chief Experience Officer at the Claims Conference and is an attorney licensed to practice both in Israel and the US. And he evaluates practices, uh, methods and strategies to improve the claims conferences interaction with Holocaust survivors in over 45 countries. So we are going to get started now with our conversation and, um, you know, three G's are really the first generation to have an open and honest relationship with Holocaust survivors. Let's start off by sharing, you know, when we realized our grandparents were Holocaust survivors and share, what our relationship was like with them and you know when and how our grandparents shared their history with us. So um, you know, I, I could start off just by sharing that I honestly don't remember not knowing about the Holocaust. And I'm sure that's something that we all share. You know, my grandparents had thick Polish accents, they spoke Yiddish at home and with their friends. They didn't really have relatives. My and my great aunt had tattoos on their arms. You know, I knew that my grandmother from a very young age, you know, had lost four younger siblings and, and that they had been killed. There were sight candles, a lot of yard sight candles um, lit during Yom Kippur. So I just remember from a very young age that there was something different, I guess, about my family and that something bad had happened. Um, and you know, I just grew up, my grandmother happened to be very vocal and spoke a lot to my sister and me, whereas my grandfather was more quiet, but, um, you know, it was just a, a part of who I am. Um, so I will hand it over to, um, Stacy. Sure. So, thank you, Beth. <laughs> and so both of my grandparents on my um, father's side, were survivors. And I have to say, I grew up in such a happy, loving family with them. They were always cooking. We would have every Sunday night meal at their house and they would cook so much food. And, you know, there was always way too much food they, and they would always spoil us. And I guess I just knew from a young age, I'm not exactly sure when, but I always knew that they were survivors. But then as I started to age and, you know, when I started to learn more about the Holocaust, I became very inquisitive. I saw there was a number on my grandfather's arm and I would ask him questions constantly. And as soon as I had a device that could record, I would also start recording him. And so it's just, it's been something that I've grown up with. But the thing that I think is so positive is that my grandparents could go through such awful experiences and lose you know, their entire families, yet they were so positive and they give so much love that, um, and, and they were just so resilient to be able to, after losing everything, fall in love and move forward in life. And so um, I'm very thankful. And Hen, um, you grew up in Israel, so there's a little bit of a different experience there, I think, um, right? If maybe you can share a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Israel in uh, the early 70s, and it was immediately clear that I was um, third generation to Holocaust survivor. First of all, because there wasn't much family. Um, 
My grandfather had uh, one brother that survived. My grandmother didn't have anyone. My other grandfather um, had uh, uh, foster uh, siblings, but not the one that were born before the war. Um, over the years, for 20 years, I've been working with the Claims Conference and working with thousands and thousands of survivors, heard endless stories of survival, but I've never heard my grandparents talk about the Holocaust. I always knew it. In Israel growing, definitely in the 70s, there's no filter about what happened in Europe uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. It is very clear. It is in black and white, as I always say it. And um, it is not sugar-coated even for very young children. And I knew that my grandparents have gone through it. But at a very young age, when I was uh, around nine or 10, my grandmother was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer. And it was the early 80s. And she never sat down and spoke to us about um, what happened to her in the camps and in the ghettos. My grandfather on the other side, who died last year in March, um, he, he came to Israel when he was extremely young. Uh, and even though he remembered, he made all the possible efforts to become this new Israeli Jewish people, Jewish person that came to Israel and was a warrior. He joined the uh, resistance prior to the establishment of the state of Israel and was an incredibly strong person and never wanted to say himself as, uh, to portray it as somebody who might be vulnerable. So even though I've heard, and I know exactly what happened to both my grandparents, because I heard it from the people around, they never sat down and, and shared it with me. Um, I'm sure there's, there's uh, that that is part of the reason that I do what I do, that Anat and Stacy and you, Beth, are involved in the efforts that uh, uh, you are working with survivors day in and day out. And uh, Anat, you know, it's a little bit different for you too, because all four of your grandparents uh, were Holocaust survivors. So do you want to um, share your story? Sure. And thank you, Beth, for moderating. And of course, to Jonathan and to Michael Barenbaum for bringing us all together for this really important day. Um, I, like Stacey and Chen and you, I think I don't remember a time not knowing about the Holocaust. Um, it was sort of just in my mother's milk all around us. It, it permeated how we thought about the world and how we lived our lives. But that said, unfortunately, um, my, my maternal grandparents who lived nearby passed when I was very young, when I was two and three, and my paternal grandparents lived in Israel. And so the way that I learned about their stories was not really directly from them, but from, you know, my mother was really the historian in our family um, and she shared and told their stories, but they passed before it was um, popular for Holocaust survivors to tell their stories in the early eighties and before people shared so openly and, um, and before we as a community probably were willing to listen the way we are now. And so their stories are lesser known to us. We know broad strokes, but we don't know details. My um, paternal grandmother, may she live and be well, uh, is still living in Ramat Gan, and she's a survivor of Schindler's List. And so she was interviewed in the making of the movie um, by, the, what, by what became the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, and that was really the very formal beginning of our family recording our story and making sure that we had it preserved for future generations. And at that juncture, we also have an audio recording of my grandfather's story, my paternal grandfather's story, which we did around the same time as all of the 3G cousins were coming of age and traveling back to Europe in different trips and different programs and wanted to know the stories so that when they were there, they could understand how their legacy, how their life is connected to those places they would be visiting. Yeah, um, so I'm actually from New York, even though I'm living in Los Angeles now. <laughs> and I did want to share with everyone that Stacy's grandfather is from Sosnowitz, Sosnowitz, Poland, which is where my family is from. So we share that connection. And, and too bad my grandparents aren't alive. I'm sure they would know people in common 
um, you know, my husband is a documentary filmmaker and he made two films about the Holocaust swimming in Auschwitz and after Auschwitz. And one of the ladies in the film, Rena Drexler was from Susnovitz also. And when my grandmother was still alive, we connected them and they spoke on the phone for over two hours and they knew so many people in common, um, which was really special. So I want to touch on, Hen, what you brought up just before is that each one of us um, has chosen to work in um, the field of Holocaust education in different capacities. And so, you know, why is it so important to us to work in this field? You know, what as three G's, what do we think we can contribute, you know, in our roles and, and um, you know, what kind of impact do we feel we, we can make doing this work? And um, before we dive into that uh, earlier, the panel um, discussion from this morning to kick off Holocaust Survivor Day, I think it was Ambassador Lauder um, who said something that really resonated with me, and that was, don't let the past become our future. I think it was him who said that. Um, and it just made me realize, you know, we as three G's really need to ensure that our grandparents' past is not our children's future. Um, and, you know, that really sums up, you know, why I know I, I do the work that I'm, you know, it was in a volunteer capacity for many years being on the board of, you know, the Holocaust Museum. And now, you know, running a Holocaust Museum, it's just learning the lessons of the Holocaust is just so critical. And, you know, we all know growing up hearing our grandparents' stories and, and you know, while they provided us with so much love and rebuilt their lives and, and you know, are a symbol of hope and, and resiliency to us, we know that they, they were robbed of their childhood their teenage years, education, they experienced so much human suffering and dehumanization. And, you know, we, so we know what can happen when hatred, you know, goes unchecked. And so we need to make sure that these lessons are, are shared with the world. And the only way to do that is through education, right? So I feel like whatever we can do in our power to really build um, a world without hate for future generations to live in is, is so critical. So I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts. Um, we'll start with Stacy again. <laughs> sure. No, and I think that's so important. It's the lessons of the Holocaust are so important for us to pass on. And the number 6 million is such a large number. And it's so powerful when survivors today share their personal stories with different groups of children in different groups around the world. And I think as 3Gs, we now inherit those stories and we can go share those personal stories with um, children to educate them around the world. I'm lucky enough that HBO has created this 18 minute documentary with my grandfather's story. So we have it, you know, being told through him. But I just think that when, um, you know, you hear the, these numbers and you don't hear an actual personal story, it's harder to grasp. And I feel, you know, we're also lucky that we have these stories of survival in our family and we can, um, you know, put a face to that uh, while we educate others. Hen, do you want to try chime in? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I think as three Gs, we are really uniquely uh, positioned to uh, preserve the legacy and the lessons of the Holocaust. I really do. Um, if we talk about the importance of Holocaust survivors, and if we are here today to celebrate Holocaust survivors, and in other events in the Holocaust Survivors Night, the Claims Conference is doing every year. And in the work that we do day in, day, day in and day out, we celebrate the lives of Holocaust survivors. What is the importance there? It's because these are the last witnesses to the horrors and the depth that humanity can reach when it's at its worth. And we are the last generation that witness the witnesses. And when third generation will be gone, everything else will be hearsay. Um, as ter I, I believe as, as 3G, that we are committed in two directions, right? First of all is there are still Holocaust survivors around us. We have to celebrate them and we have to help them. Uh, and then we really need to figure out how we deal with, 
future generations and how we help to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and the lessons that needs to be taken from them. Um, sharing the stories that are important, maybe, maybe the most important. Sharing the lessons are very important. I, I, uh, th there is a campaign going on right now. It all begins with word that is, uh, is running around. And I think it's incredibly important. And I talk about my children like that. Where can, where can it take you? When, when, I know it, it is just words, but where, where can it lead to? And I think it's incredibly important. And I urge anyone that's watching it to search it. Uh, uh, it all begin with words and to see what Holocaust survivors are saying, how it began with, with a speech and we all know where it ended. And I think that we have significantly more tasks that we need to do as 3G and as people that uh, uh, feel and care about Holocaust survivors. In a world where Holocaust survivor, uh, denial is rampant, where we have anywhere, you can go on the website right now and find endless amount of uh, websites that talk about Holocaust denial. I think first of all is 3G Definitely as, as people that live outside of Israel, theoretically we have a choice. We can make Holocaust part of our identity or choose not to make Holocaust part of our identity. And I think that all of us in this panel have chosen not only to work in that field, but it began by us making sure that we identify ourselves in some way by being third generation to Holocaust survivors. And I think that the most important part of it, and that did not exist when I was a young child in the 70s and in the 80s, is to take pride in our uh, history. It's, it's, to, it's to make sure, we all know the stories, when, when the Holocaust survivors came to Israel, maybe there was a little bit of shame of what happened in Europe. But as, as the time passed on, people found the courage and the bravery in being a survivor. And I think we need to celebrate the survivors and the people that are not with us anymore and continue and pass that to our children because we are now in charge of crafting the story, of crafting the memory. The way that we will craft it, that's the way that it will be remembered, not, in our pers not just in our personal lives, not just with our families, with our children, but for everybody around. We were the last people to be raised by Holocaust survivors and we will be the one that will carry the torch forward. So. Well said. Anat, what about you? Uh, I think I come at this from um, not necessarily only the educational perspective, but the work I'm involved in. And, and I know many of you also, it, it, Telling the story is a way of caring for the survivors who are living, um, but also the work I'm involved in is really about the day-to-day -day quality of life that aging Holocaust survivors have. And I think um, I can best express why I'm doing this work by something that one of the survivors once told me. Um, this woman's name is Sophie, she lives in Brooklyn. And she said to me, you know, when we were in cattle cars on the way to Auschwitz, she said the worst feeling was not having hope. And we just thought to ourselves, the entire world has forgotten us. There's nobody for us to turn to for help. And now with the services that you're providing at UJA and that other agencies provide to us, Claims Conference and others, we know that we have somebody to turn to, somebody to call on in our moment of need. And she quoted from the prayers that we say on Yom Kippur, you know, don't forget me in my days of old. And that calm, that, that um, peacefulness in her soul that she explained to me that she derives, knowing that the Jewish community and many in the non-Jewish community are there worrying about their well-being, about her well-being as an individual, gave her such a sense of having come full circle, having really been redeemed, not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically. Obviously you can't escape it completely, but psychologically from her experience in that moment versus where she was saying, listen, I live alone in my apartment in Brooklyn. I don't have a lot of people who come visit me, but I know I'm not alone. I know if I need something, I can call. 
And I think answering that call for me is definitely a way of feeling like I can bring some measure of comfort to the grandparents who I knew, to the grandparents who I didn't know as well. And also a sense that we can overcome that sort of psychological victimization, that as a community, we are in a position to really provide and to do. And that's to me also the legacy looking forward as a thurgy of um, be that person who answers the call, who gives voice to the voiceless, whether it's survivors or another group, but there's a message there, an empowerment that I feel like I owe to my grandparents and to this whole generation of individuals who, you know, went through unimaginable horror and survived and then rebuilt. And certainly in my family, rebuild, 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 grow, rebuild. Like that was the mantra I could hear in my ear of what we do in our life and every facet of what we do, we try to rebuild and try to recreate. Yeah, you brought, touched on a couple of, you know, important points. One is, you know, as we move further away from this history, memories fade and that that is, you know, something the survivors, their fear, you know, especially with the spread of misinformation and Holocaust denial, you know, will they remember us? Will they remember our stories? You know, and that is, you know, part of this responsibility that we feel about carrying their legacies forward, um, you know, is so important. And, and the other thing is when you mentioned the cattle cars, you know, I got chills because per, for me personally, my grandmother talked about her experience on the cattle car from when she was sent from Auschwitz in January of 1945 to Ravensbrück, which is north of Berlin. So think about it. It took a few weeks. It was freezing cold in the middle of winter. They had no food. You know, that was for her probably the most horrific time, you know, during the Holocaust. And so to this day, even when someone cattle car, you know, I get chills and I think about that. So I do want to talk a little bit because we, we had a, for the audience, we had a pre-meeting yesterday. Um, and when we were sharing about our grandparents and I was talking about my, how my grandmother had nightmares at night. And all of a sudden there was an earthquake in Los Angeles at that moment. And everyone on the panel saw my computer shake and while I was sharing my, about my grandmother. So that was like, I felt like she was like listening in on us. Um, but I know a not, you have, you know, you grew up with four grandparents who were survivors. So do you think that, you know, trauma is something that's inherited that we can actually, that, that we have, that we can pass down to our own children? Um, I, I think not just, I think, I think there's a lot of documentation about the inheritance of trauma and the intergenerational transmission of trauma in families that go through intensive traumatic situations. And that even it like, it, you know, impacts people's DNA. But I think the question that I struggle with as 3G and that I think um, others likely do as well is how do you transmit the resilience without transmitting the trauma? And it's almost like, there's, there's just a motto, you know, we're survivors, our family survivors, we just move forward, no matter what we face, we move forward, we overcome, we keep going. And that's an amazing message to pass down to children that you can really conquer anything and you can overcome. But you only appreciate, or at least I only appreciate that message in the context of understanding the depths of the trauma and the horrors that my grandparents went through to get to this moment. And I think as the third generation um, raising the next generation that some of whom will know survivors depending on their age at the fourth generation and some of whom will only know them through the stories we tell and through the books they read and the movies they watch. How do you instill that really powerful message without also instilling a deep fear of trauma or instilling the trauma as well? And I think... Um, I don't necessarily have an answer, but I think it's a question that our generation is poised to deal with. And I, and I, um, I, I shared like sort of as a joke, I say this to people that um, the trauma is so deep that even in the moments when we're trying to show we've overcome the trauma, like we always mention the trauma. So I say like, we always invite Hitler at every family simcha, because that means that in every moment where we're celebrating how much we moved on, we also make sure to say, and you tried to destroy us, but we're still here. And it's sort of like, 
can we say we're still here without mentioning you're trying to just you're having tried to destroy us and how do, are they are they of necessity interlinked the resilience and the trauma or can we reap what survivors have given us this tremendous gift of resilience without also bringing forward all of the depths of the trauma i think we can but i'm just you know that's i think the dance that this generation that we are dealing with if i can add is that okay um, I mentioned earlier that my grandparents never spoke about their personal persecution history and how they survived the Holocaust. But it was always there, right? Just like Anat is saying in, in, in the holidays. But it was in some parts of our everyday life when I would bring in... Uh, a good report card from school, my grandparents would say, that's wonderful. They can never take education away from you. Who is that, those they that they are taking away? And why do I have to prepare that, uh, for somebody to come back and might take everything that is chattel, right? Anything that can be taken away, but they can't take away education from you. And waking up in the morning and trying to figure out what are we gonna have for lunch? We're not even talking about breakfast, but there is a fear. And planning, planning uh, uh, trips around where do we stop on the way and make food, not what we're going to see, but food is, is, is to my parents, to me, to my children, I guess, have become an issue. It's, 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 it's not a given. And we, we live in one of the most, uh, um, richest countries in the world and in, in, in one of the most prosperous uh, eras of all times. And we are still worried about it. So there is a conspiracy of silence. And there was a conspiracy in silence in my family when, when my Holocaust survivors, grandfathers and grandmother was alive. But it was around us the entire time. We all agreed not to talk about it. We didn't have to, we didn't have to sit around and decide. There was no family meeting where we all decided that it would be too difficult to grandfather and grandmother to talk about the issues. Again, back then in the 80s and, and 70s, we all respected them and assumed that it was too difficult for them. And at any given moment, none of us could avoid the giant elephant in the room the entire time. So am I struggling? Yet? Yesterday we spoke about um, how do I talk about the Holocaust with my children? And yesterday evening, I saw Stacy's uh, HBO uh, documentary, and I will share it with my, my kids today. I didn't have the time this morning, but today we will sit down and watch it because I think it is great. But unfortunately, I believe that I am not able not to transfer some of the trauma that my grandparents have experienced, ex experienced my parents, have definitely felt, and I unfortunately not, am unable not to transfer, again, in a lesser degree, to my own children. Uh, so I guess the way that I've transferred uh, my grandparents' stories uh, it was the way they were transferred to me. So I knew that um, my grandparents survived the worst, but the stories that they would share with me were stories that, um, you know, how they, how they survived and how they kind of kept their humanity. And one story in particular that I, you know, my grandmother used to tell us over and over and I've kept with me that I, you know, share with other people. My grandmother was in a camp called Hasag, and it, it was an ammunition factory um, camp, labor camp. And every night, you know, they'd work for 12 hours during the day. And every single night, they would get one little piece of moldy bread. And every single night, my grandmother would take that bread and she'd break it in half. And one half, she'd you know, eat immediately. And the other half, she would put underneath her um, pillow or, you know, her makeshift pillow and um, save for the next morning. And every single morning when she woke up and she turned over the pillow, the bread would be gone. And she said, you know, was I so hungry that I just ate it in the middle of the night? And what she told my brothers and I was, 
No, you know, I, I truly believe that somebody else needed that bread more than me and stole it every single night. And so my grandmother continued to do this the entire time she was there. I mean, that little bread was all she would get to eat each day. But because she truly felt that somebody else needed that, she would break it and put that half under her bed. And, and I believe that part of the reason my grandmother survived was because she knew she was helping someone. And just as Anna and you know everyone here does in their daily jobs, you know, by helping all these other survivors, when we help other people, it also helps ourselves, right? Because it makes it, it helps you, it gives you that fuel to keep going. And so I think that that's one of the stories that my grandmother constantly shared with me. And so, yes, I mean, she endured the worst and we know the horrible things that she went through, but the aspects that stick with me that I think helped her survive that I hope will help my children and the next generations who we educate survive are these stories about helping others. And um, so that's just one of the ways that I think that we can stop from tr transmitting the trauma when you focus on these positive aspects. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I like what Anat said about also, you know, focusing, bringing the resiliency side with it, because in a way, you know, I always joke around that you, like you can't escape the Holocaust in my house, you know, with my husband's documentary films, me working at a museum. And, and even when my kids were little, you know, their bedtime stories were, you know, a chapter from how we survived <laughs> a book written by, you know, um, child survivors. But in a way, I guess I'm just after listening to you guys speak, part of me thinks that like the trauma passing, you know, inheriting this trauma also is a good thing because it gives us this, um, you know, sense of responsibility and, um, you know, to carry on this legacy. So in a way, it's almost like if we didn't inherit this trauma, um, you know, maybe we wouldn't feel so strongly about that, even though right. we all feel like we felt the love from our grandparents and, and the hope that they held on to, and they taught us so many valuable lessons, but yet we still inherited this piece of trauma that stays with us that now our kids <laughs> most definitely have. Um, but I feel like it's, an, it's actually a good thing. Um, and, you know, since we're talking about four G's, you know, in art, my, my kids are 20 and 22. Like I know it, it's just, you know, I feel good about the fact that Holocaust is just embedded in their brains, you know? <laughs> and, you know, my son said at a young age, he knows he's special because we're not supposed to be here. I, I don't know how he came up with that, but I guess that's, that's also, you know, <laughs> it's wow. part of like inheriting this trauma and, you know, sense of responsibility. So um, we, we do have some questions coming in. So I do want to um, ask you guys something that's from the audience. Um, can you tell us a bit, how did the process of uncovering your family's Holocaust stories look like? I know, Stacey, do you want to start? Because sure, I know you I'm happy to start. So yeah. I started recording my grandfather when I was very young and writing down his stories. And we had um, some other relatives who had survived as well. And I was able to um, get you know, all of the family stories written down. But then when I turned 40, I said to my husband, I really want to go to Poland. And so I went to Poland and I was able to visit, you know, where my grandfather lived before the war. And, you know, I saw the school that he had went to. I visited his whole hometown in Sosnowiec, which you're, I know your relatives are also from Beth. And then I went to another town called Skarżyska, where my grandmother was from, and uh, was able to see that town and see, you know, where the former synagogue was and whatnot. And, vis and then I visited the Camp Hasag that my grandmother was in, and I visited Auschwitz. And um, I, I put that all together. And I, I wanted to make a little movie, not a professional movie, but a movie just for my family so that we would have my grandmother's story and my grandfather's story and we could continue to pass those down for generations. And I was lucky because during this process, I happened to meet a woman named Sheila Nevins from HBO who was looking to make an educational tool for the next generations. And she said, do you have any footage of your grandfather? I said, oh yeah, I made this movie now knowing who she was, but at the time. And so she decided to you know, use his story to um, educate. And so now I feel even more lucky because I have this gift that HBO is using. And um, as you were saying about the fourth generation, my son you know, was 10 when he was in this film with his grand great grandfather uh, sharing his story. And now he goes around um, the country and actually world thanks to Zoom where 
he meets with school children, they watch the movie, and then they can engage and ask him questions. And it's amazing to see that the fourth generation is just as engaged as the third and the second. And I, I really feel hopeful because I do think that these stories will never be forgotten because we've been able to engage so many generations. That is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and I do recommend everyone to try to see that HBO film. It, it is very special. And what it, it's good for ages like second grade and up or? You know, it depends. Different schools have been using it um, throughout. So I think the youngest school that we visited was third grade, um, okay. but it's, it's gentle. It's a conversation between a great grandfather and his great grandson. And it's only 18 minutes. So it's easy to digest. And there's rotoscoping, which is when um, the artist, he took the real footage you know, a real picture, but instead of showing the real picture of Auschwitz, he traced over it. And so it's just a little bit lighter feeling. Right. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I'm, I wonder if it's similar with you guys. My grandparents were always looking, they were always in search of their relatives. And I have this image in my head of my grandfather always going through the phone book. And even when they visited other cities, they would like be happy to get a phone book from a different city to look for relatives. And, um, you know, that, that just was a normal thing in, in my family, but I, I'm really grateful for organizations like the, for me, the world, um, it's a Gremby organization for, um, you know, people from the area in Poland that our families are from, because through that organization, I went on a family heritage trip also to Poland, um, a few years ago for the first time with my parents and my sister. And, um, on one of those trips, we actually discovered new relatives um, who wow. were very close to us. So like right before my grandfather died, he discovered a first cousin. But then when he passed away, we didn't really be, um, follow up with that family connection. And it wasn't until this trip to Poland where we met that side of the family and um, really got to know, you know, it's my mother's second. And so they share the same great grandparents, which is a close connection. And we found, you know, my grandfather's last name on a tombstone with their last name wow. in the cemetery in Susnovitz. And, you know, this all happened once my grandparents had already passed away. Um, and my, um, we have family in Mexico city because my grandfather's cousins ended up leaving Poland in like the mid 1930s. And they took with them lots of photographs and we were very close to that family. And so just a couple of months ago, you know how there's always one family historian or archivist in the family. So my mm -hmm. cousin Ari has been the one going through all the photographs. And a couple of months ago, he found a photo of my grandfather from the inside of his, from the Susnovitz um, synagogue. Oh, wow. Um, it was called the Great Synagogue, I think, yes. on Dakota Street, Dakota right? Dakota Street, yes. Dakota. Okay. So my grandfather is in the front row. Um, it, he's He was a member of the choir and he was a little wow. boy. He was probably like 10 years old in this photograph. And I heard from historians, it's the only known photograph of the inside of this synagogue, the only known photograph that exists of the inside of the synagogue because it was burned down. And when my grandparents were alive, we had never seen any photos of them from, you know, before wow. the war, because they just didn't have anything. And now we're uncovering, you know, things like that. So <laughs> all these years later. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, Beth, can I, can I, I want to respond to the question and maybe tweak it a little bit, which is, you know, how did you uncover your grandparents' story? I think um, something interesting that I imagine is not only unique to me is just uncovering the importance of the story in the sense that like in the community that I grew up in, and this may be different, and maybe this is similar for you, but certainly um, in the community I grew up in, most of my friends had a Holocaust survivor grandparents. Like I didn't know there was such a thing as a grandparent without a European accent. And a lot of the teachers in the school that I went to were Holocaust survivors or were hidden children or survived like some of the older ones um, in a ghetto or camp. And the principal of our school had survived the death march and his story was known to us. And so for me, it felt like, yeah, everybody's a Holocaust, you know, like this is sort of run of the mill. Like everybody has Holocaust survivor grandparents. Everybody has this story. We're all in this together. And then I think once I traveled to other you know, places in the world figuratively and geographically, 
I realized, and, and that was, I think, the moment where I uncovered the magnitude and the power of the story and how the, the degree to which the narrative shaped my life, shaped, continues to shape my life, because I realized that most people don't have Holocaust survivor <laughs> grandparents, certainly not four of them. Um, and, and, you know, when I got married, I was like, wait, my husband's grandmother didn't have an accent. I was like, I didn't know that was a thing that there were grandparents without accents from Europe. Like it was, it was such a different, um, mindset and worldview. And only in those moments, I think as you, like we all discover our uniqueness when we maybe step out a bit from what we're used to. And it was in those moments that I think I really felt like I grabbed hold of the legacy in a really more powerful way and sort of coincided with beginning to do this work in a really meaningful way because I recognized like, okay, this is unique. It's, a, it's an asset. It's a badge of honor. It's something that I feel is almost a privilege. And in, if, I'm not sure that's the most appropriate word, but now I really have to do something with this. Like I can't just sort of leave it over here now that I realize how powerful it is. I have to put it into my life in a formal way. And so um, it's not exactly uncovering the technical story, but uncovering the power of the story, I think, for me, really happened a little later. Right. And, uh, and Ken, what about you? So just like Anat, I grew up in a, in a place where most people had the Holocaust connection. Um, from mo everybody's grandparents, or almost everybody's grandparents, mm -hmm. to yeah, teachers and and uh, maybe the odd person in the neighborhood that would go around and shout, and everybody knew that he. People would say, you know, he's gone through difficult time during the war, um, but we as children, as very young children, maybe maybe were a little afraid. But no, I mentioned that nobody spoke about it in my family. And then my, my, my grandmother passed away from, from Alzheimer and her last few years were horrible. And then you couldn't ask the question anymore. Um, I was relatively young and I wanted to know. So I started to read everything that I could almost obsessively about the Holocaust and almost exclusively. I, for a few years, as a relatively young uh, teen, I don't know, tween, right? Um, I read mostly Holocaust-related books and trying to figure out, because I knew that my grandmother came from that area and I knew that uh, she lived in that part and I was trying to figure out how did that fit, the general history fit with the personal experiences that my family has gone through. Um, and it took me years and years later until I discovered the actual technical story. What happened to my grandmother? How did she survive? What, what, uh, th there is no uh, survival story that is not unique. There's no survivor out there that did not um, experience a miracle in his way from being persecuted to being alive at the end of this world. And just like everyone, my grandmother also experienced miracle, several, in order to, uh, um, to survive this. Um, but it really took me years and years and years to, uh, of, of trying to figure out. At the end, I must say, um, I found the last pieces uh, in an archive in Yad, in Yad Vashem that was open to the public not so long ago. Um, and I only knew about it because of my work and because we, we do some research for other persecution histories. Um, I was looking for my own and I, and I found pretty amazing uh, documents, um, which I, I never thought I would be able to find. It is that amazing feeling when you see your family's name, you know, on a piece of, on a record or some piece of documentation. We also, on a visit to Yad Vashem, right before COVID started, actually, um, they, my mom and I went with my daughter and, and we found records um, with my grandparents' name for the first time, like in the DP camp and, and in the different places that they traveled through to get to the DP camp, that, that was pretty incredible. So I, I know that feeling. Absolutely. 
Um, there's another question for us. Um, what is the best way that three G's can tell their stories to middle school and high school students? Stacy. There's a, there's a lot of different organizations that have speaker speakers bureaus, and there's also some organizations that have um, uh, that help you write and tell your story. I know 3G, there's an organization, Safekeeping Stories, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center um, has one, but they're all, I feel like most museums have a speakers bureau. And so if you're a 3G and you want to be able to share your story, I would reach out to the different museums. I know, and I probably can speak further. I know you guys do the Witness Theater with um, yeah. UJA. That's another really unique program. So maybe. Yeah, I'm happy. To, um through Witness Theater and Witness Project, which are two programs that we fund, which pair Holocaust survivors with high school students. And over the course of a year, under the leadership of a drama therapist and a social worker, the students learn the Holocaust survivors' stories and then write an original dramatic script depicting their experiences. And then they, not this year um, in person, but on video, you know, act them out with the survivor narrating the story. It's an extremely moving experience to watch the transmission of a survivor's story. Um, most of us on this call likely have heard a lot of survivors speak and that's a very moving experience, but sort of watching the transition of the story, the transmission of the story is very moving. Um, I just, I also wanna say one thing about that question, which is thankfully like uh, I'm blessed in my life every day to connect with Holocaust survivors. And I, I get asked this question often, like, what should we do for Yom HaShoah this year? What should we do for UN Holocaust Day or, you know, and now for Holocaust Survivor Day? Um, and I just think it's very important that at this juncture, there are still so many survivors living, right? A few hundred thousand survivors living. And I keep telling people, like, I know you want to make it new and interesting and you want to do this, like, panel of people from all different genocides and all of that is great, but like this is the moment we have a few more years to hear survivors in their own words. And I would just urge us to embrace this moment. And we have, we will have our lifetimes in the future, God willing to inherit the moment where we'll be charged with telling the story. But while we still can, I just keep saying to people, I will find you a survivor to speak. Just I'm, ha I'm happy to help you. Like let's do what we can while we have the opportunity. I still think that's I'm um, really critical. And there are just remarkable survivors who well into their 90s are going to these classrooms, telling stories. And if you need help finding one for your community or organization, I'm sure everybody on this panel would be happy to help. Absolutely. I agree. These students are the last generation to hear from the living witnesses. And, you know, it's critical. We need to help them, you know, um, hear from a survivor, have dialogue with the survivor, because we know we grew up with it. But so many students are facing adversity in their own homes and communities. And what better way to learn, you know, from a Holocaust survivor, you know, who will, you know, help them feel empowered, give them hope, you know, teach them lessons so that they can go back to their own communities and stand up when they see someone getting picked on, you know, or bullied. Um, you know, we, we know that the survivors can teach these important lessons and change, you know, behavior. Uh, uh, yeah, I have um, relatively young children. Um, my youngest is uh, six years old. And I'm struggling with the issue of how to tell, you know, the personal stories of my grandparents and generally talk about the Holocaust. And I shared that uh, dilemma a little bit with, in our conversation yesterday. A lot of what I find um, helpful is the natural curiosity of the children themselves. Um, for those of you who didn't go to the Children Holocaust Museum in, in Beto Hamer Getaot, there is an uh, exhibit in, in, in that um, museum where you go, you, you spiral, and you go from what seemingly was the normal life in let's say the 1930s in Europe. And then for example, you go through an, a street where there's an, a lot of empty suitcases and open windows and something has happened. 
and the children would ask you what has happened and you were able to tell them. And every, ch every child will ask you a different story that matches their level in of interest, their level of um, progression with their knowledge, um, what they want to know and what they can handle. I think that when I, when I was younger, um, the way to introduce the Holocaust was very blunt. And I think that today there are a lot of resources out there that allows you to do it gradually and allow the children to discover for themselves, which I, I personally th think that is uh, the best way to go. And, and I wanted to add one more thing relating to uh, what Annette was saying. Like, like uh, Stacy and Beth and Annette, I've, I've met with countless of survivors over the years working for Holocaust survivors. And I, and I just wanted to say one more thing. Most of the survivors that I've met, even though they tell the stories, even though they're happy to share what will happen for, for, with me and for, for future generations, I found that they are not willing to be defined only by their survivor experiences. I, I've met unbelievable smart people and successful people. Uh, businessmen and, and uh, uh, people that were, uh, you know, from politicians to people that were artists. And when I meet survivors these days, if they want to tell me about their survivor story, I'm more than happy to listen. And I find it incredible every time. But I think that they are happier when they tell me about their achievement after the Holocaust, what they believe defines them today, not what happened during the Holocaust. It's not that they leave it behind. They're not ashamed. I think that as a 3G, we live through the, uh, the transformation of the way we perceive Holocaust survivors from maybe something that they want to put away to being proud of it. The people today are proud of being Holocaust survivors, but it's not what defines them. And, and if there's anything that I would, if, when people ask me, what should I talk about when I talk about Holocaust survivors? Holocaust survivors are first and foremost people. They're, they're, they are interesting and smart and funny and living life and happy. And you might talk to them about their persecution history or you might talk to them about the recent book that you've read. And both of those will be remarkable, remarkable time. Just spend the time with Holocaust survivors. Whether it, it's not about taking from them that story and, and passing it on. It's about being with them. Absolutely. It, I, I feel like we could spend hours <laughs> talking to each other. Um, loved it that I got to do this with you guys. Um, you know, I think um, it would be nice to leave maybe with, you know, what was the message that, you know, our grandparents, you know, left with us or, or what, what message do we want to share with, with people, you know, about our grandparents? Um, and, and also I, please, I want to tell the audience don't leave because we have a special recording, um, at the end of this by March of the living, um, for the Shekianu prayer. So please stick around for that. Oh, well, I guess you know, like one thing I, I want to say is, you know, I, my grandparents, their biggest pride and joy was their family, being able to have children and then grandchildren and see their great grandchildren. That was their biggest pride and joy. And, you know, I think we shared that, you know, every milestone for us was such a huge deal for them. Right. Every time, you know, we saw, saw them, my kids didn't understand at a young age why they always cried. And I would say it's cries of, of joy <laughs> you know, to my kids. When you cry, you're sad about something. But no, when my grandparents or my great aunt and uncles would cry, it was cries of laughter because they just couldn't believe, you know, that they were alive to see, you know, all of these great things. But the one important lesson that my grandparents did teach me, which I didn't know as a lesson growing up, was just that don't get too complacent. They loved America. They were so patriotic and grateful for what this country gave them, which is always remember, you, you know, you can't be too complacent because that they, they knew they, they just had that in the back of their heads. And so 
we know that, you know, life is fragile. Democracies can be fragile. You know, we, and so I, I just feel like that's an important lesson for me to always remember. Do you guys want to share one last thing before we turn it over to the, um, the next? Um, uh, I would say for my grandparents, the messages were what you said, Beth, that life is fragile and you just, you know, every moment is um, sort of a gift. Mm -hmm. um, and the two other really core things were that for my grandparents, their survival was an act of faith and holding Jewish traditions mm -hmm. and just connectedness to community and to Torah learning and to mitzvot and to practice in a very regular way was a legacy that they felt like they had to continue and was a duty to bring forth to their future generation. So that is a very central tenet of their legacy. And um, also the notion that like, the connectedness of the Jewish people, sort of, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what you look like, where you come from, how you observe, what you're practicing. Like we are, you know, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew was sort of the way they would say it. And that we really need to care for one another. And they cared for people of all backgrounds, but a particular sense of responsibility to care for other Jews in need. So in a, a similar way, uh, I think my grandparents would say the equivalent, the Jewish equivalent of Carpe Diem, which would be Shechianu uh, v'Kiimanu v'Igianu l'Avman Azeh, and they would also add to that to Lamakom Azeh when they meant Israel, and they would always mention that from like the Phoenix, Phoenix, right? From the ashes we've risen again, risen again, and we're able to create that fabulous country. And they were very proud of being Jewish and being and living in Israel and and celebrating. We're celebrating Holocaust survivors today and another day, but they were celebrating Israel every day, not just on Independence Day. They felt it was their, for them living in Israel, they, they felt it was their victory over the horrors, over Hitler, over the horrors of the Holocaust. Every time they heard about uh, uh, a new invention made by an Israeli inventor, they felt that they contribute somehow to that. Every time mm -hmm. there was a new sky rise in, in Tel Aviv or, or uh, um, somebody won, I don't know, the Eurovision contest, they, they would think about, you know, we've, we've conquered, we've made it. Um, and they instilled that in me. I still do. I, do, I still celebrate all those little uh, victories for the country and for our nation. So, absolutely. Nice. Stacy. Sure. And I'd say my grandparents, my grandmother's since passed, but my grandfather is 95, um, are con were constant optimists, right? And they always kind of taught us to see the um, positive in every situation. And then I think the other thing that they've really um, wanted to instill in us is to always look out and take care of others. So my grandparents, when they came to this country, opened a fish market and people would come in constantly who just didn't have money. And my grandfather, well, both my grandparents, they would just give food to everyone. And, you know, they, they said, we know what hunger is and we just can't bear to see other people People like that. And so I think it was this idea of, you know, almost like the Jewish philosophy to Kim Olam, right? Like just always take care of others, repair the world. Um, and so I think those are the two legacies that they would leave. Those are great lessons for us to <laughs> live by. So thank you. And um, I guess with that, we'll turn it over to um, the March of the Living um, recording. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. The Shehechayanu blessing is said whenever we do something for the first time in a season or in our lives. And because this is the first International Holocaust Survivors Day, I'd like to sing the Shehechianu for you now. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu Vekiyemanu 
והגיענו לזמן הזה שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה Last month.